next speaker is Matthew Hansen, and he will discuss data needs for the management of land resources. Uh, while we're getting set up, I'll introduce Matthew. He's a remote sensing scientist with a research specialization in large area land cover and land use change mapping. His research is focused on developing improved algorithms, data inputs, and thematic outputs, which have made enable the mapping of land cover change to regional, continental, and global scale. His current research includes taking global processing models for motors and applying it to the land staff archive. Exhausting, exhausting planning of the land staff archive has been used to map forest disturbances in the Congo Basin, Indonesia, European Russia, Mexico, Quebec, and the U.S. Matthew has a BS in electrical engineering from Auburn University, an MA in geography and an MS in engineering from the University of North Carolina, and a PhD in geography from the University of Maryland, College Park. Great. So, as soon as we're set up here, I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation of sharing some of our thoughts with you on the data. You know, I think uh, it's interesting, Brad's talk, a lot of the work we've done with global land monitoring was driven by uh, the incoherence of global data that was, was uh, put together by synthesizing national data sets. The FAO is the repository, the official repository for a lot of uh, global information on forest and agriculture. And the FAO's had experts get together and, and, and come up uh, with a meeting to define what forest is, and there's 800 some definitions. So what is a tree, what is a fancy, all that kind of stuff. What, is, what, what a Namibian forester defines as a forest versus uh, uh, the Ministry of Forestry in Indonesia. They're very different. They're the biggest idea with a satellite is that we can normalize uh, our land cover resources and have a globally consistent approach to mapping. So, I'll give a little history in terms of our, our global work, and, and again, the idea is, I think we started with NASA, particularly to help parameterize global, China, global climate models and circulation models, and uh, this is in the picture of a uh, product made by Ruth DeFries, published in 1994, by 360 pixels by 180 pixels, derived from ABHR and UBI data, so a monthly greenness image of the globe. A simple maximum likelihood uh, classifier, which is a parametric central tendency, very simply simple to operate. Um, this is published in peer review, and pretty often you're really excited about it in 1995. <laughs> I'm going to zoom into a pixel in Arkansas, a mixed forest pixel, one degree spatial resolution. There it is. <laughs> mixed forest in Arkansas. Um, NASA produced what they call the Pathfinder time series data sets with the ABHR, ABHR, a meteorological satellite. Developing methods to avoid the atmosphere and kind of filter out the land signal. And they produced two series of data sets. One was the Pathfinder 8 kilometer data set, and there, there we've got some more detail, we have some yearly forest uh, cover out there. They had a couple of uh, uh, global one kilometer realizations, and now we can see some cities coming out uh, in the landscape. Uh, the MODIS sensor was launched in 1999, had seven land bands at 500 and 250 meter spatial resolution, so we started making product with that, even better yet. The really important thing was the release of uh, Landsat. And Landsat predates all of this stuff. But Landsat was launched in 1971. It, it, it was the time of the, the, the photograph of the blue marble by Apollo 17, fully illuminated the disk of Earth in, in the void of space. We had Landsat then, but we couldn't process it. Uh, it was not thought of as a global asset. It was, it was tasked somewhat arbitrarily in areas of interest. The biggest photo processing lab was Eros, the, the, the archive in South Dakota, because they shipped all the images out in glossy roll formats that people drew on light tables. And we still, I mean, when I got into it, that's the way it was done. So we didn't have the data mining algorithms at all. We had these really simple parametric models. We didn't have the throughput to, to, to actually query and take advantage of the digital content of the pixels we drew on light tables. And uh, yeah, we certainly couldn't scale any of this up. But the biggest, out of all those limitations, the biggest problem was that you had to pay for the data. And one of the bigger themes that I will say, if bar none, is open and free data. Because it's not big unless you can get it. It doesn't exist if you can't get it. And so 
2008, Landsat opened up the archive. And pre before that, people like Ron Love and the Arrows would say, scientists use the data they can afford, not the data they need. It. So you'd have you'd have to budget this little, you know, your, 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 your acquisition of data, study a little corner of the world. If they open up the entire Landsat archive file, well, now I can make this map, and this this is now we can see the bottom line part of the forest. We can see the uplands that are they're more kind of checkerboard because that's land use. We can track through time the chain. You can see that this entire big one one degree by one degree square turns over in about 15 years. So now we're at granularity where we can see human footprints in a human national landscape, <coughs> and we can map this uh, this uh, dynamic at the global scale because the archives go open. So I'll go back to the global second. Big part of our process, though, I just to emphasize seven, you know, going from many, many <laughs> pixels to a whole lot of pixels. Landsat is this incredible uh, asset that, that is kind of, you know, inconsistently operational in, in, in history. Now, NASA has a sustainable land imaging program. If you look at the archive in terms of number of acquisitions over time, before 1999, not a lot and not globally acquired, very haphazardly acquired. So again, from our perspective, big data, if I'm going to do uh, global monitoring, it can't be patchwork, it can't be biased. And all commercial archives, they're supervised, right? There are just a few systems that are like, we're going to grab the entire Earth every chance we get. And that's what we need to build Earth's, Earth system science data records. In 1999, Mindset 7 was launched and it included a global acquisition strategy. They're trying to get at least a single image every season so that they can build that. And our, our work at global scale really starts here. Going back here is very hard. So you have uh, Mindset 5 and 7 working together. 5 dies. 5's uh, design life is something like you know, 8 years of less than 20 some, almost 30 years. Um, then we just had Mindset 7, a real data crisis. So in terms of big data consistency, here's this, you know, this rolling thing. I think, you know, for the ease of algorithm implementation and the turnkey approaches to doing any of our, you know, our kind of monitoring work relies on consistent data sets. And this is not a consistent one. It has some problems. Then you add lines that age, now we're up to over 400,000 images a year, globally fantastic. We're in this golden age where we can really opt turnkey, you know, uh, algorithms somewhat here and not here. It's a big deal. Now, I would just highlight Landsat as being like it. It's a NASA USGS operated instrument, but you know, NASA has always been about free of charge, easy access. All of these data are available to everyone on the globe. Important. We can scale global to local. I'll talk about that in a second. And I got some big numbers. I thought it was a big data. I some big numbers. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of data. Um, so I want to show. One of the big processes uh, behind our, our, our idea of big data is and with open archives. You go to Brazil, and Brazil has this fantastic annual uh, atmospheric window where they do their deforestation monitoring. This is the Arctic deforestation. This is the MODIS image. The point is that this entire area in July and August of every year is cloud free. When they grab images, they look at a single image, they map it, they wait till next year, map it again. It's very clean, it's super. If you go to any other place in the tropics, because these forests are like 13, 14, 15 degrees latitude south, go to the <coughs> equator in Africa, you want to try and apply the single date approach to data in Gabon. We'll zoom into an area of Gabon. We're going to look at all the data from a year. The year is 2000. This is Landsat data from the year 2000 over central Gabon. Okay, so if you change, you start studying climatology and things like that. <laughs> I want to, you know, don't worry about that. Rule of the but the, the idea here is that Brazil method doesn't work, it, but in fact, this image has millions of good pixels. So a big part of our work is data reduction. We can, we can, we got the five million images, and it's just a little bit of information out of those images that is really relevant. And so we, we can turn, we can selectively pick the good look. So we have a big QA on the front end, throw away clouds, haze, shadow, water, and that's what this place looks like, which you can never understand with any single image. So big part of big data for us is reduction, data reduction. Um, and if we do that, we can build time series of the Earth without clouds and look at different changes. 
our, pri our first product was this uh, product of tree cover in loss and gain. We're continuing to process that globally at 30 meters. We say that it's globally consistent but locally relevant. If you test out the book you are, you will see the dynamic of book you are, and we'll have some utility, and we want to prove that. <laughs> all we need is this, this information scaling uh, from, from the global to the local that we think is valuable. Um, we're looking at trends, trends in terms of change. One of the big trends in this data set is the reduction in deforestation in Brazil. These simple themes, uh, like tree cover, loss, and gain, it's not great, right? It's very simple. People are interested in deforestation. They're interested in loss of peatland forest. They're just very specific things, right? But in the big data context, it's very hard to do a particular, uh, let's say, peatland forest loss to go to <coughs> scale. We, do, we stick to a hierarchy. Our themes are very general, and then we nest down into more and more detailed thematic outputs. And I'll show an example of that here, where we make a primary forest mass over the human tropics. We look at the three big countries uh, for their trends in the high conservation forest loss and stuff that's really important for carbon emissions and biodiversity loss. This is the gross dynamic for these three countries. This is the dynamic if we filtered by high conservation value forests since 2000. You see the policy in Brazil. Way to go. They've just gone up from like 5,500 square kilometers to 8,000, but this is a huge deal. And I always pump up this little, because we're the only one in, in the tropics to have <coughs> enforcement of that policy that's really resulted in change. Indonesia passes Brazil, even though they got a quarter of the forest. And DRC comes up close to these two, and there's no agribusiness for the Delta here. Like 70, 80 million people feeding themselves with axes. But this gives really good context. So this idea that you know, this hierarchy of information, some information works at global scale, some works at regional, some works at local, and we have to be realistic about that. This is further evidence of the thing. So this is a few quick stories. I hope they're quick. Um, you know, um, this is a croplands expansion in Brazil. So you start bringing other things, putting them together. When we look at the where all the soybean goes in and, and the Amazon basin, um, the policy of the soil moratorium and not sourcing soybean from the Amazon basin means that all of the change in deforestation, and that you see these pinks here, this is new cropland and forest, was done, was performed, you can't see the, the dates here, in the first five years of the, of the century. And after that, all of the forest cover loss converted to soybean moved out into the Sahara. This is not the rainforest. So the idea is that policy is very successful in soybean out of the high conservation value forest, but the demand of change. The big agro, they're interested, they gotta find new land, and they do. They find a lot of land in the Sahara, so they're torn milk. They, you know, when they think about they don't need they don't need for now to deforest any of the Amazon. In fact, they recycle already cleared pasture in, in the Amazon and they clear the forest in, in the Sahara. So getting these more complicated narratives that, that build on the policy, but also kind of more holistically see its effects, such as leakage at this time. This is the Congo. I uh, the stories here are you know, manifold, but here it's not agro industry, it's just population. We didn't have villages here. It's, it's these, these, these areas of, of, of uh, settlements along trunk roads in the context of statelessness and war. And you see people leaving the roads, going into deeper, denser forests to get away from connectivity because they said they, they uh, began to associate connectivity with, with violence and, and war. I kind of relate with that. Here's an example of data to green transparency to a contested number. So in Indonesia, they have shown in official data a trend going down in terms of deforestation. All of our data shows going up. And we have a, we had a, a Ministry of, of Forestry uh, uh, researcher come to do a, a PhD with us and kind of compare the data and come up with a very clean description of, in fact, the trend in primary forest loss, especially in high conservation value peatlands going up. So in other words, business as usual, despite the release, the release of these tabular numbers, without the release of spatial data behind it to show a, a, a decrease. So I think transparency in terms of big data is a huge deal. And more people looking at the same thing through public data access uh, allows us to either you know, point out disagreement but more importantly, hopefully, come to a consensus. We also do near real time data, big data. So, this is a, an alert system for deforestation, and this is in Peru. And so, we're just populating the year with data. You see a logging road come in here, 
and then we extend it, and you can see the extractions off to the side of it. We're producing this for uh, for about five countries right now, and they're using it. They're using it in Peru, in Peru, out in the states of Ucayali, and here in Madre de Dios. They they arrest people and use these these this, these images and products as evidence in court, which you know, freaks me out a little bit. I'm kind of nervous about that. But one of the parts of big data is how do we, if we do this at global scale, can we can we farm it out? So through USAID silver carbon, we take these global uh, processing methods and we just cut out the country that that that, that, that we're partnering with, you know, Republic of Congo, uh, Bangladesh, Peru, and we use the same exact data mining methods in the context of their lab. We deliver all the data pre-processed, that data reduced uh, to the, the the important layers that allow them to do their mapping. So this is this idea is um, basically front end work on data reduction. We do the algorithm and the discovery of what the data mean. They they employ that. We also work with other themes. So I'm just going to show an example of Gary Brown. This is a, from a data mining perspective. It's an interesting question. I'm, 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 um, it's we're targeting a bare ground gain. Think of urbanization if you want. So when we talk about bare ground, we can see changes in bare ground over time. So anything that's blue here is new, devegetated, denuded uh, area. So all around the Dallas Fort Worth Air Airport, Dallas Fort Worth has always changed. It's an interesting thing because you're processing huge data to find a very tiny dynamic. And Marie knows how tiny it is, I think, uh, for sure. But this is a uh, this is the idea of bare ground gain. And in the end, when we map it, it is it is less than a hundred thousand square kilometers over a decade. It's like a needle in a haystack. But if you have really good calibration, really good methods, you can find it and build up time series like this to show kind of like the trends in all these bare ground type game dynamics. So they are commercial residential development, mining, infrastructure, and they go up with the, and then they have the global financial crisis that they have. So very faint comparative signal if you see tracking with really key economic indicators. This is China accounting for 35% of the global dynamic, the US half of China. You give China six times the infrastructure zone in the U.S., et cetera. Australia, Russia, uh, Canada dominated by resource extraction. So I'm sorry this thing is not looking good at the glare, but uh, this is the U.S. You can imagine. You can see the, the, the outline here. You see, you know, um, fracking fields in Arkansas. Fracking fields all combined with urbanization now forward. Anyway, that's big data to find something very small. We also work about big data in the time series. We want to do crop type mapping. It's all about time. It's all about the temporal profile. What are the phases of growth of soybean, corn, wheat, what time of year? So it's a, it's a different way to look at it. We have to, we have to tease out temporal signatures. In this case, it's Ohio. In July, corn is separated from, from soybean very easily. And we can map crop types at scale. And we can do this. One of the points I want to say with big data and our kind of work, it's not so useful in the US. We have USDA agents everywhere. <coughs> it's really useful in Brazil, Argentina, China. We, and the idea with our kind of top down buyer approaches, the method that we test here and work here, we can apply it to these other places and meet with success. So, this is an example of soybean, this past year's crop across all of South America going to Brazil, all the way down to Pampas and Argentina. I want to say a couple of water examples. Water just falls out, but you know, just to make, make this point that you know, land cover is a suite of topics. It's, it's trees, it's, it's, it's cover, it's land use, it's, uh, it's a bunch of different things. So this is this is the meandering interannual changes in the Mega River right below uh, Dhaka over a 15-year period. This is intraannual inundation of uh, rice paddies in Java. Where the water comes down the spine of the spine of Java. Highly organized way to make the rice crop. All of these products are based on dense time series of data where we, we QA them, we throw away the body ones, we throw away the shadow ones, and we keep these and we run algorithms on them. Each year is a little different in density because it's an inconsistent record. And in this case, it's a pixel from uh, Brazil that was forest cleared, burned, and then turned into pasture land. And there it is. And you have to have, I think, you know, this Landsat or MODIS or these, these kind of open, public access, unbiased collections of big data to do this work. 
commercial data are not going to be available like this generically to everybody everywhere. So I really do give NASA and USGS a lot of credit. And now the European Space Agency are modeling their Sentinel series on the same approach. And uh, you know that's how you, that's how we can achieve uh, these kinds of records. So I went back to my my my, my uh, original slides were these big pixel daily systems that are poor spatial resolution, but every day we get a picture. Landsat, we get every 16 days with a single instrument, but we can use it in a virtual constellation, so we have two of those working together now. We have these commercial devices that are into these, into these constellation ideas, fantastic, but uh, I, I'm not convinced we can do global assessments with these data. We're very far, far, far away. I don't know how much we can share what we learn in this space with other people. Landsat will be combined with the European Space Agency data sentinel too, and we'll get closer to this. This is the holy grail, right? This is high spatial, high temporal. We're close with these virtual constellations of public good infrastructure. Maybe we can get uh, this working as well in the public domain. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, when you think about the GPS, and you every time you get a signal to navigate, you don't pay for it, right? It's a global public good, it really is. They use it just as much in the music. And I think Earth observation data, when they when they released the Landsat imagery for free, they did a study after three years and they found that the applied use was just domestically paid for the mission. And that's really the way it is. I, I am not into ultra commercialization of paper play stuff. It's it's not gonna work for my work. It'll work in a case by case basis, but not for bigger science and understanding global environmental change. I don't believe I have some conclusions so.